Perfect. from the ISC. Awesome. All right. So uh, it's 402. We'll call this meeting to order. Uh, first item on our agenda is to uh, adopt the minutes of our last meeting. Could I have a mover and a seconder um, to uh, for adoption of those minutes, please? Uh, Mark, thank you. And a seconder. Looking for another. Thank you, Pedro. All right. Any uh, question, concerns, additions, deletions to those minutes? Seeing none, uh, all in favor uh, that the minutes of our March 17th, 2022 meeting be approved. All in favor, that is carried. Thank you. Any uh, declarations of pecuniary interest for today's meeting? From anyone, seeing none. Uh, let's move on to the adoption of today's agenda. May I have a mover and a seconder to adopt our agenda for today, April 14th? Looking for two people to do that. Thank you, Pedro. And someone to second, please. Thank you, Eric. Um, any changes, additions, deletions? Seeing none. I'm uh, done. Yes. I do want to add an agenda item, but not for today's meeting, for the next meeting. So how would I do that? Um, Emily, I believe that uh, Jamie could send that to you um, for inclusion in, in our uh, next meeting, correct? Yeah, you can also, like, if you want to just mention it briefly on a high level right now, you can. Yeah, sure. I was just looking more at um, basically... Um, the, of course, the federal government came out with their 2022 budget. So just very quickly, a lot is in there about green procurement and about uh, greening buildings. And, and basically, I want to understand a little bit more how it ties to our greenhouse gas reduction plan and what the city's doing for um, green construction and green renovation for, for municipal buildings. And not only municipal, but also what's being discussed or with the different builders who have homes and whatnot in the community for, for GHGs. So just very, very quickly high level. So that's what I'm interested in, in discussing on our next meeting, if possible. Thanks. But I'll, I can send you a note, Emily. Yep. Thank you. We will get it on the agenda. Thanks, Thanks. Jamie. Um, all right. So any uh, other additions uh, or changes to today's agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving <clears throat> our ESC agenda for today. Seeing all in favor, thank you very much. All right, the next item on our agenda is our Community Development Fund Green Program, I'm sorry, Green Initiatives Program Application Review. Emily, could you take us through that, please? With, uh, I believe that's item 5.1, which is the um, invasive species workshop funding request. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Donna. Uh, so firstly, uh, welcome to uh, Tara uh, and uh, Darissa from the Invasive Species Centre. I see you're both here. Uh, welcome to the uh, Environmental Sustainability Committee meeting. And thank you for your submission to the City's Green Initiatives Fund. You are the first application this year. So we're, uh, we're excited to see that. Everyone was provided with the application in your agenda package, along with the um, budget and the quotes, costs that they've come up with. Essentially, the Invasive Species Centre is looking to develop um, a one-day public outreach workshop on invasive species. There'll be a morning and an afternoon session. The goal is to raise community awareness um, regarding early detection and capacity building through increased reporting about invasive species. Um, and then in the afternoon, uh, they'll be talking about some, some different initiatives uh, regarding um, uh, uh, plants, so plant invasive species. And there's actually going to be a giveaway um, of a seedling uh, for participants involved in that. So when you go through the application, there's um, a great deal of detail, a great variety of detail that's been given uh, with regards to the benefits uh, that this type of um, workshop can be done regarding early detection of invasive species, uh, the benefits of planting. Um, it aligns to the uh, biodiversity garden that was launched previously um, in partnership with the public library, which they've identified as a partner again. 
Um, it also aligns very much with the city's greenhouse gas reduction plan and the city's um, working work on attracting the Canada Water Agency. Um, so I will ask Tara and Darissa if there's anything else that the two of you would like to add, um, and then we will open it up for questions from the committee. Is there anything else, Tara or Darissa, that you would like to speak to about the purpose, uh, goals uh, of this workshop? Thank you so much for summarizing that so well. That was, I think you covered quite a lot of the information. Um, I guess the only thing I would maybe add is the morning workshop is going to be focused on aquatic invasive species. So that'll tie in a lot to the, um, the clean water goals um, by sort of raising awareness of uh, different other invasive plants or invasive fish that can sort of degrade water quality. So yeah, that's all I wanted to add. Great, thanks. Teresa, anything to add on your end? Good? Okay, awesome. So what I'll do is I'll turn it over to the committee. Um, and we've got the experts here who've submitted the application. So does anybody have any questions regarding the scope of this project? Um, questions, now's your time. I'm not seeing any questions, Em. Yeah, I, I was, um, what's your, um, uh, how many people do you anticipate will sign up like, do you have an idea of, of how, how large of a group we're trying to attract? Yeah, the goal of the workshop is going to be between 20 and 30 people. So that's how many um, red maple seedlings we've planned to order. So that would and be is the there, is, is, there a fee, is there a fee? I didn't look no. through the deep. And then you people would have to pre-register for this workshop. Yeah. And it's a full day workshop. Yes, exactly. Okay. I'm just, um, we've had different workshops um, over the years and it, it's, it's just, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm be very interested in um, seeing to get interest in that and, and uh, how many people we could get. It's a, it's a big commitment for people. And also I think there would be some particular uh, key people that we would like to see at a workshop like that can have influence and spread the idea. So um, yeah, I'm, I, I'm just would hate to see a lot of effort when, and if we don't get a high like response rate with regards to participants, you, you know what I mean? It's just, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that, that uh, the date and the time and, and during a work week or a work day, these are all sort of issues. And who's your target? Are you looking at, at people uh, like lay people or professionals in the area? Or? Yeah, the, the target is so um, community members, but also anybody who would be working with invasive species or in the environment within the community. So it would be anyone in the community of Sault Ste. Marie who would benefit from an increased knowledge of invasive species. Did you speak to there. Bill Cole? He, he, I know that he's done, uh, I mean, the, I know Clean North has, has been uh, trying to raise awareness with, with regards to invasive species for a long time. Um, it would be fun to, uh, be good to hear how, um, how well they can uh, engage community in this topic. Uh, I'm just curious. I, do you know Bill Cole? He's Hi. the president of Clean North. Yes, uh, Tara is actually one of our coworkers that isn't located in Sault Ste. Marie, so she may not be familiar with Clean North, but um, I am familiar with Clean North and Bill Cole. And um, I know that they've done some great blog posts on invasive species in the past. And we are looking to have both inside expertise from the Invasive Species Center, but also have some guest speakers from other community members or organizations that are working with invasive species at the workshop. Um, so that would, is a great suggestion for someone that we can reach out to as one of the guest speakers. And uh, to your point on audience, we were looking at in the middle of the week um, because in the past we've found that, especially in the summertime, weekend wor workshops are harder to get attendees um, because everyone is off on vacation or 
doing the other things that they enjoy. So uh, we were looking at in the middle of the week. And the reason being, another reason is because um, we find that a lot of the interest comes from either working professionals that are looking to broaden their horizons with invasive species information, as well as uh, retirees um, looking for like garden enthusiasts or Sioux naturalists or um, those types of community members, but it is open to the general public and the information is very adaptable to um, whoever is attending and the variety of expertise, expertise or previous knowledge. Yeah, because I think Bill brought up a point about um, some of the local uh, garden stores, Canadian Tires, Home Depot, they actually sell invasive species to the public. So that I think we have a lot of educating to do and, and it would be, I would be uh, interested in understanding how that even happens and who orders plants like that and, and, and the lack of awareness. So obviously there's a huge need for what you're doing. I just that the right ears hear the message and, and people who can have uh, an influence on, on this. So anyway, that's for plants particularly, but I'm sure there's a lot of uh, other invasive species that are not aquatic <laughs> or there are uh, aquatic species or et cetera. So thank you. Maybe just to add to that, Tara or Darissa, I know um, in your budget, you have um, allocated some funds for marketing perhaps you could speak on a high level to the type of outreach you are going to do to ensure that there is a, uh, a, an awareness of what you're trying to do with this workshop. Yeah, yeah, like the Invasive Species Center is really great for getting the word out on things. So for, for this project, we did put room in the budget for both um, um, a, an ad in the paper, The Sioux Today, and we also have a digital advertising budget. So that would be um, that would be Facebook, sort of social, different social media. And we also have um, a, it's sort of a biweekly media scan that we can include it in, which has a pretty good reach. And um, a lot of people who work at the Invasive Species Center have large networks of people who would be interested in this sort of event, which oh, we'll definitely all share with our networks. So we have a we have pretty good experience in getting information to people who need it. That's that's a pretty big. And we've worked closely with other local organizations as well with similar interests. So sharing it with those organizations who can share it with their following and their networks as well. Thank you. Looks like Pedro has, has oh. a question, Emily. Yeah, just sure. a point. Hi, uh, Tara and Dorisa. It's really good to see you. <laughs> Dorisa is one of my students. <laughs> it's good to see you, uh, doing this work. Um, yeah, so yeah, a lot of people don't recognize that uh, invasive species is one of the greatest challenges right alongside like global, global change factors right alongside climate change and uh, environmental pollution, microplastics, it's right up there in, in, in the threats to biodiversity ecosystem functioning. And we do have a lot of invasive species and are predicted to have a more, lot more invasive species coming into uh, Algoma, to St. Marie. So events like this are instrumental, they're essential to educate the public. I, when I hear only 30 people, you know, a workshop is, we can only reach so many. But uh, my uh, question um, is how, how much more can you then summarize what um, is covered on the workshop, uh, during the workshop? How can then you uh, link up with uh, newsletters, organizations, uh, other social, like other media to reach out as much, reach as much people, as many people as possible? A lot of people don't understand that their actions, the plants they buy um, can escape and they do escape. We actually have done research on this in our urban forests. A lot of plants escape into urban environments. And, um, and, and so the people that are coming to the workshop, how are you then, there's only 30. So how can you spread the word after that? That's my, my question. I don't want to jump in, Tara, but perhaps you want to speak to the um, planting kit and the booklets that are part of this. 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, as part of the workshop, we're going to be giving away a native plant planting kit. So that's um, it's going to include seedlings and a uh, red ma uh, red maple seedling that they people can bring home and plant in their garden, as well as information such as, for example, um, there's a grow me instead guide, which is really useful for gardeners to plant native plants instead of invasives. Um, so the people from the workshop are going to be going home with plants they can put in their garden and information on invasive species that they can then communicate with either anybody who maybe they'll come to their garden and say, oh, wow, these are some great plants. And they'll be able to talk to them about it and they'll be able to spread awareness that way. And um, we'll also be... Sort there's of, some booklets, right? That you're yeah. going to be printing? Yeah, there'll be booklets that are printed and those will also, we're planning on giving some to the Sault Ste. Marie Tourism, I think it's the tourism office. So that'll be available to the public for information on invasive species. So anybody who comes and wants to visit Sault Ste. Marie. And we'll also be promoting the biodiversity garden at the library, which is a great example of um, planting native species and people who will be part of the tour of the biodiversity garden will also be able to tell their friends, oh, look, at, there's this great garden at the, the library and people will gain interest in that. And so but the more people who visit, the more people will learn about invasive species issues. Yeah, so the garden is located just along the walkway towards the library. So, um, and it will have a sign speaking to the biodiversity garden and the benefits of planting a, bio a native biodiversity garden. So, um, you know, community members that are just walking by and especially we know there's lots of events that happen at Clerk Park. Um, so that it will get a lot of attention that way, passive attention, I would say. Um, and although there is, we have uh, money set aside for an ad in Seuss today, but we could also look at actual, um, an article to either work, publish with Seuss today or a media release in that way to get the word out. Um, some other ideas that we could, if it's of interest, we could look to recording some of the clips um, from the workshop to make it available afterwards to those who didn't attend. Um, that way the information is still there and I mean they would miss out on the in-person experience as well as the the toolkit but they'll still be able to have a toolkit in a sense of those resources that are available and the local knowledge as well so this will be very focused on the Algoma area and Sault Ste. Marie so you know that knowledge will be available. That's excellent great thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, no, just a, just a comment from me, uh, Tara and Dursa. Thank you so much for presenting to our group today. I thought your application was really comprehensive. So it was nice to see all those details built in. Obviously a lot of thought went behind this. I think that uh, it must be so exciting to do an in-person event when everybody's been locked down for so long. It makes me think of Andre's question towards accommodation for others, like, or actually reaching more beneficiaries. It, you mentioned maybe a, a recording. I know personally, if something's recorded for me, I don't usually pick up on it after the fact, but I love the idea of maybe a live stream or something like that, uh, even on a Facebook. I don't know if that's possible, but certainly you could have more people reached in, in that way, because this issue, as Pedro's point, is extremely important. And I personally, now that I know of it, would love to sign up myself. So count, count me in. Thank you. Well, that's excellent. Thank you. And that's a, absolutely a great idea to look into live streaming, live streaming services as well. Okay. If there are no further questions, um, the motion is uh, be it resolved that the um, environmental sustainability support the request for funding uh, uh, in the amount of 26 hundred and forty dollars and forty cents for this workshop and I'm looking for a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Mark. Um, all right. Any further questions? 
Seeing none, um, all in favor? Uh, that is carried. Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. Let's go get those invasive things out of here. All <laughs> right. I appreciate the enthusiasm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Enjoy your long weekend, ladies. You too, everyone. <laughs> Okay. With this, though, like Emily, is is the city would the city help promote this too? I'm sure we could. It's it's in alignment with a lot that we're doing, so I'm sure we could promote it on our communication channels as well. I'll be in touch, okay, Tara. I just, yeah, I was just meaning if you guys have something too, then send it to me, and I can we can Perfect. put it on our awesome uh, Facebook and yeah. put out that information too, just to spread the word more. Um, Great, yeah, that'd be awesome. So we'll be in touch, Tara. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to agenda item number six, uh, which is um, Eric Emelson's community spotlight about his work at Natural Resources Canada. Um, Eric, thank you very much. Um, away you go. Okay, let me just make sure I can share the right screen as usual. You're seeing slides now? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, I thought I would just take a make this uh, chance to basically introduce some of the work that my team does at the Great Lakes Forestry Center. Um, I'm the lead scientist of the watershed ecology team and our group basically generate science to support the sustainable management of Canada's forested watersheds. And before I get into some examples of some of the work we do, I thought I'd just start with sort of a high level overview of, of NRCAN. So there's basically in Natural Resources Canada, there's basically three sectors that are science focused. That's the lands and minerals sector which is the center of expertise on Canada's landmass. So this is things like the Geological Survey of Canada and, and uh, they do, and also uh, mining related research. Then there's a Canadian Forest Service, which is, it's the sector that I'm part of. And we, as a sector, collaborate closely with provinces and territories and industry, uh, just to ensure the sustainable management of Canada's forests. And then the third is the energy technology sector, and that's a sector that supports primarily the advancement of clean energy technologies. And then there's several policy focused sectors, um, all of which we have some interaction with uh, from the science side. And the Great Lakes Forestry Center is one of six Canadian uh, Forest Service centers in Canada. So the other five are in Ottawa, uh, Fredericton, New Brunswick, um, Quebec City, Edmonton, and Victoria, BC. And within um, the Great Lakes Forestry Center, we basically have uh, three research divisions. So it's a forest ecosystems division, a pest management division, which focuses on insect outbreaks that affect forests, and then an integrated ecology and, and economics sector. And uh, I don't know if you're seeing this window here or not, but I'll just get rid of it just in case you are. I'm seeing it. It's distracting. Uh, the building itself is also um, home to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Sea Lamprey Control Center, and, as well as the Invasive Species Center, which we, that we just heard from, and the Insect Production Quarantine Labs, which are, those are actually run by NRCAN, by Canadian Forest Service. And they're quarantine, high level quarantine labs because they actually rear invasive species, um, insects primarily for scientific research. And they distribute them around the world for research. And then about, uh, about 80 kilometers north of uh, Sault Ste. Marie up in the Batchewana River watershed off of um, mile 38 road. We operate as well the Turkey Lakes Experimental Watershed Area. And that is an experimental watershed that's been running with long-term environmental, environmental monitoring since the late 70s. 
Uh, there's four monitored lakes up there, 13 headwater catchments, several meteorological stations, permanent vegetation sample plots. And there's also, um, it's also part of the Canadian Air and Precipitation Monitoring Network. So this is a monitoring site that was established primarily for acid rain research and has since transisted to have some focus on um, on forest management impacts and also climate change impacts. My team at the uh, at the Great Lakes Forestry Center is the watershed ecology team. So we have three technicians or analysts in the group um, that do both lab and field work. And I work closely with universities too, quite a bit. So right now we have three students that are working out of the Great Lakes Forestry Center from various universities. So Eric is actually from the University of Cambridge in the UK. Maddie's from McMaster University and Jonathan's from Laurentian University. And we also work uh, really closely with uh, Lisa Veneer's group in particular. She's another scientist at Great Lakes Forestry Center and primarily with Caroline and Emily. And we basically share a lot of analytical facilities because Lisa does a lot of similar work to me, but her work is focused a lot on soils. So within um, my lab itself, we do a lot of uh, dissolved organic molecule analyses of water and um, carbon and nitrogen analyses in water. We do a lot of DNA and RNA based work um, to identify microbial communities and microbial community functions, greenhouse gas measurements and environmental systems and radio, um, radioactive isotope based work. So basically all that's to say we, we do a lot of basically molecular ecology work. And uh, the, the broad focus is to understand how changes in our forests are, are affecting um, the response of the, the basically the um, organisms and the by geochemistry of streams and lakes. And the reason we're interested in how forests affect these things in streams and lakes is because all of those molecular processes are basically the backbone of all the ecosystem functions that we are concerned about in water. So things like nutrient cycling, carbon cycling, um, pollution cycling, and, the, and just the productivity of aquatic systems in general. So all these things that support all the ecosystem services that we really want to protect in streams and lakes are driven by all of these, um, these molecular processes that we study. So I'll just quickly go over sort of three examples of the, to give a sense of the kind of research that we do. Uh, and basically all covering aspects of, of understanding how to sustainably manage our forests to protect, protect the productivity and functions of our freshwater systems to maximize carbon sequestration and to mitigate freshwater contamination. And something that people often overlook is the fact that, that aquatic systems play actually a major role in, in carbon cycling globally as well. And that there's a close tie between forests and carbon cycling and water. So just give a few examples here. The first one is that we have some work going on in the Gaspésie region of Quebec. So we're our national organization. So we, our research spans the whole country. Um, and there's been an outbreak of, the, of spruce budworm that's been going on in, in the Gaspésie region of Quebec for six plus years now. Um, that's what the map on the bottom left there is showing is the spread of the defoliation of trees by this insect. So it eats the needles off of spruce and fir and, and um, I'll explain why we're interested in this in a second, but basically we're interested in understanding what the impact of that defoliation is on aquatic systems. And the way we're investigating this is that we have 12 experimental watersheds, six in the area, six of them are being sprayed um, the way they would nor are already spraying to control spruce budworm in the area. So they're spraying with a biological insecticide called BTK. So six of the watersheds are being sprayed that way. The other six were telling them to do nothing and just let them become defoliated. And then we have an experimental comparison we can do. And we're 
interested to see how this defoliation affects nutrient cycling and all, everything happening in the streams, essentially. And the reason it's such a federal priority is because to understand this is because the loss of these trees, the defoliation can actually lead to tree mortality. And the spruce fir trees are such a major, su such a major part of the economy in that area. It's a in New Brunswick and that area of Quebec. Um, it's just a, a lot of the local economy is driven by forestry. And so if you can imagine if all these trees are killed um, by an insect and that can take decades to recover and it can really hurt the economy. So there's a lot of money put in to control these insects and it's very expensive and there's competing strategies on how to do it. And the, the more aggressive strategy is that you spray with harsher chemicals that basically kill the insect and prevent any defoliation at all. And then there's a more passive approach, I guess, um, where you basically just spray to prevent mortality, but you don't prevent defoliation. So you prevent the trees from dying, but you don't prevent them from being defoliated. So understanding how defoliation is impacting the environment ar around uh, aside from just the trees themselves, is part of the justification for uh, for the work we're doing to to help better inform the cost benefit analysis of these decisions. Uh, another example of work we're doing is actually understanding the role of forest management and harvest on the fate of carbon in water. So whether it's sequestered or emitted to the atmosphere. And this is the work partnered with the University of Cambridge. We have four experimental watersheds just north of Sault Ste. Marie, kind of near the Turkey Lakes watershed. We're working with the local harvest companies, um, Bonifero and Clerg. And so two of the sites have been harvested experimentally and two have been left as controls. And we're doing what we call a, a backy design. It basically means before and after. We measure before and after they're harvested in a control site and then sites that have been harvested. And we're measuring water through the soil uh, with these wells that I'm showing in that image there. And we're basically taking a bunch of, of carbon measurements to see how, when you cut the trees, how this affects carbon cycling into the water. And the reason for that, the, the reason for doing that work is that essentially forest management has been, the, the cutting of trees has been proposed and the replanting of trees is proposed as a means of, um, of carbon sequestration to meet like IPCC uh, recommended targets and so on. So um, basically the idea is that constructing more buildings out of wood sequesters carbon out of the atmosphere. And, and basically that will, and planting trees to recover that basically further enhances carbon sequestration. But we wanna know that it, you know if there is enhanced pressure like that on our forests, with the goal of sequestering carbon, what is the impact on carbon cycling in water? And there is recognition of the need to incorporate this kind of stuff into global and national carbon budget models. And then quickly, the last example to give is about understanding how forest harvest impacts contamination in waters. So mercury is the issue we're looking at and mercury has been something that's been implicated or sorry, forest management, cutting of trees has been implicated in, the, in contamination of uh, fish by mercury. And the reason for this is that mercury is a natural thing and it's present in soils. It's also deposited on soils because of industrial inputs and it circulates the globe and falls everywhere. It stays in soils relatively inertly in a form that's not generally not a problem. But when you disturb those soils in some way and it runs off into water, it can become a problem, essentially. But the thing is that when we actually look at studies to see whether they're, to what degree forest management is having an effect, it's really variable. Sometimes you see a big effect, sometimes you see no effect. Um, so we want to understand where we're at in Ontario on that. So that's what we're doing. We're taking some long-term disturbance data that's been collected by our, our organization and the province. So all data on disturbance for the past 40 years in Ontario, including cutting of trees, fire and insect outbreaks. And we're confining that to the area of Ontario where there's management of forests. So that's what, where all these points are. 
And then within that area, there's 600 lakes, over 600 lakes, where there's also information on the mercury levels in fish, which represents over 22,000 fish. And we're trying to understand if there's a relationship between those disturbances and the mercury in fish. And basically that will inform whether there's a need to adjust provincial management practices or not. And then also if there's maybe certain sensitive areas of, of Ontario where perhaps we should target some changes to forest management practices to prevent contamination. So that's it. That's an overview of the kind of work we're doing um, and some of the, kind of the work that we have going on right now. Uh, thanks, Eric. Um, that's... That's a lot of, uh, that's a lot going on there. Um, if you don't, yes, thank you. Um, who's got questions or uh, want to start a discussion about, uh, about the work that Eric does in terms of um, more information? You want? I knew it. Go ahead, Jamie. <laughs> yeah, Eric, thank you. That was a great presentation. You know, when I looked at it in the agenda package, I was like, oh, I hope this goes well. And it really did. So you did a good job. <laughs> Uh, highly technical, you made it very understandable. So, you know, thank you for that, uh, first of all. Uh, second of all, you mentioned that some of this work might be developed with a lens to incorporate it into like a federal or Canada-wide carbon budget, which I find really interesting because I think that that would be something highly variable and uh, connected to weather events, climate at the time, I suppose, as well. So like, could you speak to that? Like, like what's the complexity like in, in understanding or translating your work into something at a federal policy level? Well, there is actually, like Natural Resources Canada and the Canadian Forest Service actually is already responsible for the, the national carbon accounting model for Canada. And it's primarily focused on carbon, um, accounting in like carbon storage in forests and carbon fluxes from forests, being that that's the majority of our land cover. Um, and it's a model that's been in development since the early 90s and going through various iterations. And it incorporates things like, already has a whole bunch of algorithms to incorporate things like forest change into predictions. Um, there is a conceptual leap to linking water carbon cycling into that and it's a conceptual leap that a lot of people are working on resolving not just me um yeah so that's a that's a big initiative right now okay thank you um other questions I'm I'm glad that to... oh sorry sorry i was just gonna say i'm glad that was understandable i have yeah I have, that's a very refined version of a seminar that I've given to several university, undergrad university students too. So I think I've had some chance to refine it, but I'm glad it was understandable. So thanks for that comment. <laughs> I have a couple of questions, Eric. Um, you mentioned several um, studies, I guess, if that's a proper word, that you're undertaking in various different areas on various different um, issues. Are any of them prioritized are any of them more important or have a bigger impact than the others or are they all equally important in terms of the the work that they're trying to figure out um no i don't think any basically this if this work is funded work that i'm doing it's already been recognized from by somebody as a priority so um so no i don't think i don't think i could rank any of them as higher priority kind of depends Every, you know, um, different provinces will see some of that work as higher priority than others, that kind of thing. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say any of it's higher priority than others. And what's the timeline or the, I don't know if this is the right way to ask this question, but I'm just curious, like, what's the timeline or the average timeline or whatever it takes from when you start these particular projects to how long they take to come to fruition and when you can see the results and make recommendations and then, um, you know, as Jamie a bit alluded to, like get it into the system in terms of how, so if you look at the one on the, the budworm, for example, like how long does it take to go through all of that and then how long before you can say, hey, this is the best way to do this? Well, it does vary, although I would say the average study is probably three to five years in duration. Um, 
well-designed studies are are informing decisions while the work's going on and the decisions are refined as the work goes on um, but that really varies a lot depending on who the information is going to and the nature of the studies <laughs> so it's kind of hard to say um, it varies a lot and okay. and the translation of science to policy is a whole other thing that i could talk to you about for a long time <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, because I'm obviously that's where, you know, that's where all of this great work that all of you are doing and collaborating. So, you know, globally, in some ways, from what I'm seeing here, that's where it all comes together, right? That we, we do things differently that achieves the desired effect or, or whatever it is. It's so interesting. Thank you. Um, anyone else with other questions? All right. Seeing none. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for the time you put into that. Um, I know we all appreciate it. Uh, so our second spotlight presentation today is gonna be from Pedro. Uh, he's gonna tell us uh, about all about what he does, uh, where, where he lives and works every day. Pedro, take it away. All right, all right. thank you. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen first. So can you see my screen? It's here. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna share my presentation now. Um, okay, can everybody see it? Yeah. So we see presenter view, I don't know. Oh, okay, so that's not what I want. Um, uh, this usually works, I'm not sure what I'm doing. So I'm gonna stop sharing, okay, I'm gonna... See if this will work. Can you see that now? No, we just see your screen. Yeah, and now. Yep, we're good to go. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Um, nope. Yeah, and I thought it was improving things. Okay, so um, thank you for this opportunity again. So I'm going to talk about the Plant and Soil Ecology Lab. That's my lab at Algoma University and the lab that I've been trying to uh, build uh, over the past decade or so. And uh, my goal there has been to create, uh, alongside with the students, a collaborative, equitable, diverse, inclusive group of creative uh, and independent critical thinkers. Um, and so in this, uh, you see some photos here of some of the students and uh, you see a, a photo of the campus we've also been building um, since Algoma became independent in 2008. And um, yeah, and, 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 and at the university, we um, try to um, increase our knowledge and uh, about, uh, about science in this particular aspect and train students, uh, train highly qualified personnel along the way. Um, so what is the problem that I'm trying there uh, since the inception to, 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 uh, to look at why it matters, why we should care? So the Plant and Soil Ecology Lab focuses primarily on um, global change factors and how that impacts soils and ecosystem functions. We know the intensity of global change factors like biological invasion, soil pollution is increasing. Global change factors, they alter native biodiversity. They increase the risk of native species extinctions. They affect species behaviors. And they can, in many cases, also affect ecosystem functions. And ecosystem functions is what leads to the clean water we drink or the air, the clean air, air we breathe and, uh, and, and, and access to food and all these things. So uh, basically, um, it's also the, the tackling this problem is what, what's at stake is our sustenance as a species uh, uh, which is at risk right now. But, you know, there is a recognition that uh, uh, how little we, we know about biodiversity, uh, let alone ecological processes. We focus a lot on soil fungi. We, we've described about, um, like in science, we know about 150,000 species. We think there's 5 million species. There is a huge uh, that we don't know. So we don't understand well the consequences of what we are actually doing to the planet because we lack so much knowledge. And so in the Plant and Soil Ecology Lab, this is what we try to do um, every day. 
So um, some of the things we've done, that's what I wanted to, 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 to talk about today. Um, and you see some students here already like uh, collecting some soils and uh, walking around in the forest. Um, so over the past, um, over the past few years, we've uh, in the lab, we've uh, trained highly qualified personnel, right? That's the goal. That's how, for example, NSERC uh, uh, defines the, the training we do. Uh, and a lot of people have passed through the, the lab, postdocs, PhD students, master students. A lot of these PhDs and master students, they uh, come to Sault Ste. Marie, to the lab, through collaborations with people from all around the world. Um, so I'm very thankful to collaborate to our, my collaborators, of course, and uh, of course, bachelor students that complete their thesis. Uh, NOHFC, for example, funds a lot of interns. And this has brought people, uh, students from all over the world, from Canada, Japan, even South Sudan, uh, Mexico, et cetera. So uh, it's wonderful to, 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 to have the opportunity to learn with all uh, people from all over the world who come to our campus. Um, so then, okay, what have these students done? Uh, where are they now? Uh, what has been the result of, of, uh, of, of their training? And I'm sorry that there's not enough time to showcase everyone who has passed through the lab, so I could only highlight uh, a few things. And uh, I'm going to highlight um, students that have contributed in three main areas in the lab. And these areas are invasive species and native biodiversity. That's a big area of focus as we have and NSERC Discovery Grant, and I have a Canada Research Chair uh, that funds a lot of that work. We also, another area is environmental pollution, soil pollution more specifically, and we have a big collaboration right now uh, with the University of Guelph that was funded uh, for close to a million dollars to look at microplastics in the environment, both in aquatic and soil systems. And then a uh, third area, is tied to soil ecology, but tied to uh, agricultural systems. So I'm gonna cover some of these, these three areas and um, in more detail here. So starting with invasive species. So when I started, one of the main questions I had was, what's the status of invasive species in North American boreal forest? There was not a lot of information at the time. So one of my first interns, uh, who is now a project coordinator at Lalamond, is Laura Sanderson, and we wrote uh, this paper on uh, the status of invasive species in the North American boreal forest. I'm going to point to the papers we've published and the students have published, uh, and uh, not so much talk about the results in the papers. I can highlight a few things. So also at the time, I noticed that there wasn't a lot of information on uh, at least a comprehensive guide in Ontario, more specifically target to, the, to, 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 to hardwood forests on what are the most invasive species uh, and why are they invasive and how should we manage them? So I needed to have, uh, I wanted to have a, a better grasp about that. So actually with Lisa Derricks, who's now still working with us and he's, she's the St. Mary's uh, Remedial Action Plan Coordinator. Um, we wrote a book, a guidebook that includes a lot of information about uh, the, uh, the invasive species, why they are invasive, uh, why we consider them invasive based on, on the literature, and that uh, became available a few years ago. Um, another question in this area uh, we had was, can some of the most invasive plants in southern Ontario actually invade the north? So we have a few studies in this area. I'm going to highlight the work that Angela Dukes, uh, who was first an intern, now com then completed a master's through Guelph with me, and, and, and uh, is now an educator here in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, we, we worked on dog strangling vine. This is a species that is extremely abundant and in, in invasive in Southern Ontario. And we were wondering if can this species establish in Algoma? So we did all these experiments where we modulated temperature and soil conditions from Southern Northern Ontario. And we were able to actually um, conclude that it will probably be just a matter of time be, uh, before this species is going to also invade the north because it can grow in our soils, it can actually grow in the temperatures and etc. So that was some of the work we done, we've done in this species, we've done in other species like garlic mustard. Um, then we were also interested in uh, other questions. What ecological mechanisms drive invaders and exclude native plants in urban forests? And so here 
as a postdoc from Spain and Olivia was one of our bachelor uh, students uh, and, and, and now actually she was just called to the bar in 2020 showing that students that come into biology, they can go to be work at a radio station or be medical doctors or become lawyers. So uh, it, 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 it's interesting that way. Um, and so here we actually looked at some ecological mechanisms tied to pathogen acquisition and, uh, and, and dynamics and of invasive uh, um, trees in our um, and, uh, urban forests here in Sault Ste. Marie. This was published in Urban Ecosystems. Um, we were also interested in what, what features make urban forests more susceptible to plant invasions. This is actually work that came out this year. We used citizen science here. This was a work primarily done by Catherine Ducheneau, who is now um, uh, doing her PhD at uh, Georgia Tech. She's moved on. Uh, and, um, and we actually used data from citizen scientists. A lot of people here in the Sioux who uh, used our protocol to create an inventory of all the native and exotic species present in, I think it was over 20 urban forests across the Sioux. And then we applied us to the spatial statistical models to see what are the main drivers for the prevalence of, of, of invaders uh, and from, and, and you can get all more of this information in detail by, by, by reading this paper. Um, more recently, uh, we are looking at, we've published already some work before, are pathogens accumulating over time in invasive plants? We know they are. Are these accumul the accumulation of pathogens causing invasive de declines? Uh, will we see declines? Will these spe species event continue to become invasive? At what point and which species may decline over time? And we know we've, we've looked, for example, at dog strangling vine, and we over 100 years, we did not find that there is necessarily more pathogens over time accumulating on these plants, that uh, this particular species that continues to be very invasive. This was work done by Nicola Day. She, she actually now uh, just got a faculty position in New Zealand and uh, moved to New Zealand, is extremely happy there and uh, building a great lab. So um, yeah, that was, that was work. Uh, this work is continuing to expand. Um, and at the moment, uh, Dr. Catherine Fahey was a postdoc in, in our lab. Uh, we are trying to answer the question, can we predict pathogen accumulation and consequently invasive species declines, which I already alluded to. More specifically, this is unpublished work. We actually submitted a paper recently. We're looking at what traits, what kinds of plant traits may make these plants more susceptible to being attacked by native pathogens. And so if they are more susceptible, then would they would they start declining? What traits may give an indication of that? Because there's so many invasive, so many non-native uh, uh, species um, in our uh, ecosystems that we have to establish priorities. And so it's if we can somehow um, learn a little more about what particular species we should prioritize for control, and if this can help, um, and and it's very um, fundamental work at this point, um, but that's the line of work that that uh, that we're trying to pursue uh, with this type of research. Um, and I'd like to explore this more over the coming years. So that that is a summary for the for the invasive species uh, ecological work on environmental pollution. I just mentioned microplastics, plastics in soils is something that is emerging as a as a concern. We, as I mentioned, we have a, a, a recent grant and started looking at effects of uh, microplastics on plant growth uh, and how do these plastics may get into even plants uh, and other soil organisms. So our first student working on this uh, worked with on his uh, undergraduate thesis as our, our capstone uh, thesis or project at the end of the of the fourth year biology degree is a capstone thesis. Um, and that's the work that uh, Eric did last year. He now is still working in the lab, but moved on to a, um, a master's at the University of Guelph. Eric is a very, uh, it's an interesting case because he also came from Sioux College. So he brought all this excellent, excellent knowledge from Sioux College, then worked here and now he's doing a master's. So it's, uh, and I know he wants to come back to the Sioux uh, very much. So, um, and, uh, and, and what Eric did, and we were able to publish his work 
this work very pioneer, you know, pioneering work really. Eric got uh, fluorescent microplastics into the soil and um, and was he was interested. To, to, he, he, he was curious to see whether or not protists, some of the smallest uh, uh, animals in the world uh, that live in soil, you can see them here in this photo on the left. Um, and then he added fluorescent, green fluorescent plastics, just to see if microplastics could be eaten by these organisms. And of course, if they can, then these organisms are part of the food chain. You can see on the, on the, on the right-hand side, um, the microplastics we could we could find them inside the inside the, um, the digestive system of the, of the protists. So um, so this is very um, preliminary work, and uh, now we 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 are hoping to follow up on on what the consequences of this may be. Um, just to conclude, some of the of the areas of work I mentioned, we work also. Uh, I'm interested in applying. Uh, soil ecological science to uh, improving agriculture. Uh, we know plants interact with a huge variety of soil microorganisms. What does that do for plants? We know some organisms are pathogenic, others are beneficial. So what's the net effect of that? And one of the work, some of the work we've done, and this was work done by two postdocs uh, funded by um, Agriculture Canada, um, uh, Dr. Akihiro Koyama, from uh, who's who, who is now um, he was here for for four years uh, and is now a, an assistant professor at an MSU, and uh, Teresa Diaz from from Lisbon, my hometown. She came over and um, was able to work with us in this project and is now back as a researcher at the University of Lisbon, and. Uh, um, and these are people that forever get connected to the zoo. They come back, they visit. It's it's really wonderful that way. And then we continue to collaborate on in projects. So here in this this particular research, we were interested in seeing how. So when you have a plant, the plant uh, interacts with organisms in the soil, and it's going to, in a way, train these organisms. It associates not each plant associates with organisms in a little bit of a different way. It will provide carbon in different amounts and, and, and uh, different characteristics of carbon. So uh, it's these plants are going, a plant leaves a legacy for, for plants that are decided in a community. But it, in, in the case of agriculture, when you have crop rotations, one crop after the other, a crop can leave a legacy to the, to the next crop and so on. So if you, we were interested, how can you pick the best sequence of crops that leaves the best legacy for the next crop. <laughs> so here in Algoma, a lot of farmers, they use canola and then maize uh, or corn and soybeans and alfalfa as a rotation. And uh, we, we were able to set up this experiment and figure out, um, I'm not gonna get into the details, but you can see here that if you do um, maize after canola, um, the canola, you get 5% increase and from the soil biota increase in biomass and yield than if you grow alfalfa after canola. So you have the, the best sequence based on soil biota legacies from one crop to the next on the left-hand side, and then the, the sequence that we would not recommend necessarily based on um, soil legacies of, of these crops. So this was uh, just recently published in Ecological Applications. You can get more information if, if anyone is interested. We are now trying to bring this into the field, much bigger project uh, working with MSU, which is awesome. So um, so what's, the, what's next for us in the lab? Well, basically continuing to study the relationship between plants, so biotic diversity and ecosystem function. And uh, I, I love to train students and, uh, and we try to do so in an equitable, diverse and inclusive way. We try to learn and think as much as possible about what Chief Xing Wak uh, had envisioned for um, Algoma University and for that site um, for, for, for um, generations today and generations yet to come. That's our mission that we take very seriously there. And uh, you see here one of the students that came through the lab, even during COVID, Karina, who's now doing graduate work at University of Calgary. And um, yeah, so um, that's about it. I mean, no, we can't do any of this work without lots of funding. Uh, funding applications and these agencies uh, and university and this community has been instrumental to 
uh, to, to, to allow for all these students to continue to study here and maybe stay here and uh, wherever they go in the world, um, uh, be connected to us. So for more information, you can also um, uh, take a look at our, our lab and I take any questions. Thank you. Wow. Once again, whoa, that's an eye-opening um, eye presentation for sure for me. Um, anybody with questions or comments or want to start a discussion about, uh, about what Pedro's work is and the work of, of, uh, of, 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 at the university around these issues. Pedro, are you able to, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Anyone with some questions? Emily. I would just like to say, um, with both Pedro and I know Eric had to jump off, um, both of your presentations uh, really uh, reiterate the fact of how much research is happening here in Sault Ste. Marie, um, contributing to uh, things across Canada, but also research globally. And Pedro, I think you did such an eloquent job at bringing recognition to the uh, students and academics from away that have come here and contributed to research here in little Sault Ste. Marie. Um, it's just so inspiring and it speaks very, very well to how much is, is coming from Algoma University and your team. And it was just very, very impressive. Thank you. That's very nice to hear. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Mark or Andre or uh, Jamie, go ahead. Sure, just have to find the unmute button as per usual. Um, <laughs> Pedro, thank you for that talk. I enjoyed hearing about all the different questions and curiosities of your students and yourself to drive this research. Um, theoretically speaking, if budget and funding was not an issue, what is the top priority you would have to work on that would be relevant to our region that you think is the highest priority? Huh. Um, I, I usually think globally about the research and the questions we ask. We may low, we, we, we work at the local level. Um, for example, the work we did uh, in Sault Ste. Marie's urban forests. That's relevant to Sault Ste. Marie. The data is there for Sault Ste. Marie, but that model can be applied in cities all around the world. And that's why it was published in an international journal. So the, the goals is to train students in tackling questions that are priorities. All of them are priorities. I wouldn't want to, um, again, like Eric, prioritize uh, one versus the other. Although, um, but when it allows students to be uh, highly qualified anywhere. If I would prioritize the research, um, uh, an, an area with tied to climate change, for example, is that a lot of studies have focused or focus on um, factors individually. For example, the effect of CO2 uh, or elevated CO2 on plant growth or carbon sequestration, right? But we know these things are multifactorial. Very few experiments, especially tied to soil ecology, um, are multi multi-factor, multifactorial, uh, in modulate if you experiment with modulate even three things: temperature, moisture, and CO2. <laughs> Very it's rare to find some experiments that do that. And a lot of experiments are also abrupt. Uh, and we know that climate change is not abrupt, but it's gradual. And that needs to be accounted for. So I'd like to, if, they, if, if funding was no object to be able to put together big experiments that allow us to modulate several factors and have treatments with incremental, inc being incremental or gradual versus abrupt. So that would we need lots of technicians, lots of funding, but we would generate so much, much uh, um, more um, impactful uh, data for sure. Hi, Pedro. I'm particularly fascinated by microplastics and um, intrigued by your work. Um, 
the Great Lakes, Lake Superior. You, are you monitoring microplastic in the soil or in the water or both? This team of, of, of this team, uh, and we'll have a website very soon, uh, is looking at both. And that's what made this project very interesting. Uh, I can send you a diagram. Uh, we have people looking at the soil and the aquatic systems. So looking at things like biosolids, um, which are applied to uh, terrestrial systems, where do they end up? Would they end up in aquatic systems? So we have people from both in both areas. We're also very much concerned about um, the size, the size, the amount of microplastics. Microplastics can become, they continually degrade and become smaller and smaller, all the way to um, sizes that can actually get into uh, people's, uh, into our bodies, for example, or potentially into several organisms, like you saw protists and um, and we still have know very little about what the consequences of this may be over time. So in, in Sault Ste. Marie, like I know that we, I, I, it's interesting because uh, we have uh, done, uh, uh, trying to uh, put this into practice by having a ban on certain types of plastic. And I know that's just the beginning. And I don't know about you, but I remember as a child, we, we didn't, see a lot of plastic the amount of plastic we use today is every, ubiquitous it's everywhere and and everything's wrapped in plastic and i try to challenge myself to go grocery shopping and not buy anything in plastic and it was just impossible to do yet you know 30 years ago it was easy to do so I, you know it's it's funny how your work is so critical and yet we have a a practical possibility here to convince, you know, the political process and the scientific process, uh, and 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 the ability of taking knowledge and science and and change people's minds. I think that is the challenge. I think of scientists, right? You have to be able to take the science and and use it to make change, right? So the committee here is it's, you're perfect for this committee. So I hope you can help us with that. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm a strong believer that it's possible to protect jobs and even create jobs while protecting the environment. They're not mutually exclusive. And with plastics, um, we have to recognize there is a plastic debt, meaning this is a global change factor. And the debt means that it will continue. It's here. It will continue to accumulate. And we don't fully understand the consequences uh, for that. So the idea of a of an environmental lens so that we can make policies and make adjustments in ways that are um, consistent with the economy, economic development, environmental protection, I think are key here in this microplastics. But I know that uh, people on the committee have, and, and our chair, Donna, has initiated a major policy change with single-use plastics. So that's awesome. And that's the way to go, for sure. Thanks. Thanks, Andre. Um, anyone else with questions for Pedro? All right. Thank you, Pedro. That was really informative and very enlightening. I have a lot of thinking to do about what you and Eric just talked about. Um, all right. Uh, Pedro, you're up again uh, next uh, to give us an update on um, our priority projects. And you're part of that working group. And I know you guys um, that you had a meeting. Um, what do you want to share with us about that? Sure. Thank you. Yes. So we did meet um, and uh, we talked about uh, three topics. Right. So we had the first one was start an annual active transportation commute survey campaign to better determine and promote uptake year round. Uh, then the second one was to hire an artist to paint selected street stormwater gutters with drawings saying us the St. Mary's River or the ocean starts here. And then the third one was the uh, add a pillar to the Green Initiatives Fund that allows for project applications to encourage uh, healthy and resilient uh, ecosystems, including habitat restoration. So on the first one, on the active transportation side of things, uh, we, um, we, we discussed that we need to seek alignment with the city's active transportation master plan. So um, we know that the kickoff is taking place uh, very soon. Uh, that there's going to be consultation uh, that's going to include a baseline of uh, active transportation in our community and the steps to increase them. 
And then uh, we uh, will be exploring ways to seek input uh, from those that are already using active transportation for commuting and uh, communicating that to others, um, how to do it. So um, we started the initial steps to design um, one-stop shop, uh, a website uh, where we are looking to uh, include information about active transportation laneways, um, looking at profiling people who commute, how do they do it, uh, what do they wear um, year round, how do they do it in the winter, what kinds of active transportation they, they use. Uh, this includes, you know, trying to think broadly about, uh, about everyone, even those who um, have potential physical challenges or things like that. So very inclusive uh, as well. Uh, we also want that uh, website or one-stop shop to show cost savings. So uh, put together some materials that show how much money you can save even in non-winter months uh, on, with average gas prices increasing, for example. Um, so that was, uh, that was decided that was uh, we also going to be um, the city is hoping to bring a partnership with ADSB to pilot with uh, high schools uh, tied to the design of this uh, of this website. So um, maybe I'll stop here on this one and take questions, and then we can talk about the second and third. Um, there are there any or or would you like me to continue with the other two and then ask? Well, questions? I think um, this is sort of a summary of if I can just jump in, Pedro. Of course. Um, that we, we talked about um, with what we're going to look at, like there's things happening with the active transportation master plan, um, but like the goal is to create, as Pedro said, uh, like a one-stop shop on the city's website with some information. Um, we also talked about how this, this, this project could actually trickle into a city studio initiative, which I know we've talked about on the committee before. Um, so, there might be some trickle down projects into there. And we're gonna talk about that more at our next working group meeting, but we wanted to open it up to the committee to see if there was any feedback on this idea, um, if there was any comments or additions to maybe add to this website. And then maybe we'll go to the other two just to keep things rolling. Mm -hmm. so, so you want me to continue, yeah? Or maybe just pause to see okay. if anybody wants to add. Any questions? Right. Um, Pedro, of course, I'm, you know, I'm passionate on the topic and, um, and we've done in the past uh, a lot of work in the cycling club to on, on cycling, particularly as active transportation. And um, we are, uh, we have a bike week coming up and the club is organizing uh, some events around uh, to promote active transportation. Uh, one barrier that seems to be uh, really coming up, uh, people are very concerned about getting their bikes stolen and uh, secure bike uh, parking, secure bike storage, particularly at workplace, seems to be really in the top two or three what I call barriers. So the clothing and the equipment is, is certainly and uh, of course, the uh, the infrastructure itself, the lanes, the bikeways, and the shortcuts, etc. They're all part of it in the bike itself. But I think uh, uh, it, this is a theme that seems to be going right to the top. Some people are getting their bike stolen. Other people don't want to even start because they're worried about it. And I think that if we could, one of the ideas we are trying to get employers. Uh, encourage employers to uh, ensure that uh, their employees who decide to ride their bikes to work will be provided with secure bike parking. And, you know, uh, the tragedy, like even uh, Roberta Bondar place and Peter Henry is uh, one of our directors on the executive. And uh, I, ca I cannot understand how that organization is unable to provide sheltered secure bike parking in this day and age and this is a government agency i mean and then of course we could go down the chain so i don't know if there's a way perhaps that um an awareness campaign even for employers or, or, or an incentive or an encouragement way um for that particular aspect of the whole 
cycle, if you wish, so of, of active transportation. Anyways, that's one thought. And um, what we're doing in our club, we're asking people to submit, nominate their employers if they have great bike parking. And we're going to provide rewards or certificate and recognize them publicly for the best, the, the most bike friendly workplaces, you know. And, and again, that's a very, and you know what? City Hall is the first place we should start. And I tell you what, I go over there with my bike all the time and their bike parking sucks. <laughs> Although Pedro, it, or it, sorry, not Pedro, uh, Andre, if I can jump in real quick. Um, that's actually one of the things that we're hoping to highlight. Uh, Pedro mentioned we're going to try to highlight, like, what can you wear, um, different months, some of the advantages, but also highlight um, because there's actually action taking place in our community right now, like at the hospital, for example, they actually have a shelter um, that has been built for bicycles. So we're hoping to feature that to help help bid moment, build momentum um, on that level. And I know, um, I know this is something that you're very passionate about. Uh, and in the essence of time, maybe you could shoot an email to the group and um, okay. we could go from there and we can just move to the other points because I think we're just shy of the 15 minute mark here on the meeting. No problem. Yeah, thank you, Andrea. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that for sure. Uh, the second one was to hire an artist to 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 paint the the, uh, the gutters, right? Uh, with uh, Saint Marie Saint Mary's River starts here. So Emily's already in talks with ADSB about Yellowfish Road uh, through uh, Trout Canada. So considering to expanding the, this this program, um, is, is she's also going to connect with the City Summer Moon Festival 2023 team. Um, and we'll have uh, a call for artists uh, that could contribute here. Um, we could apply this to, to public art, and uh, but Emily will keep us and uh, and uh, and uh, up to date uh, on this. Uh, Emily, do you, would you like to add anything here? Yeah. So um, that's exactly right, Pedro. This the uh, the city's me. <laughs> I'm working with the ADSB to try to move forward on the Yellowfish Road campaign through Trout Canada this year. Uh, this is a good reminder for me to follow up with them and see where that where they are at on that. We're hoping for June once the snow hopefully <laughs> has all melted. Um, but the City Summer Moon Festival um, puts out a call for artists every year, and we talked about how for the, the artists are already selected for the 2022 year, but this is an annual festival. So we were thinking about um, talking to the manager of uh, Rec and Culture at the city and seeing if there's a way when they put the call out for the call for artists in 2023 to see if there might be a way to work with an artist to do something more large scale than just the Yellowfish Road program as it pertains to stormwater pollution awareness. Um, so this is on our agenda and uh, we will definitely keep the committee up to date on that. Okay, thank you. Matt, I just have a quick question about that. Is there any chance this is something we could at least get started this year? Is that uh, for, the thing? for painting, like yes. an artist to do it this year through Summer yeah. Moon? Well, whatever way, whatever way we could do it. You know what? Yeah, it not may not happen through Summer Moon, but absolutely. We can see if there's a way to do something a bit larger scale than what the students are doing or build upon what the students are doing to do something more um more big so let me get back to you on that one donna that'd be super if we could get it happening this year thanks Sam. Mm -hmm. so the last one is to add a pillar to the green initiatives fund that allows for project applications to encourage healthy and resilient ecosystems including habitat restoration so we're we started to work on coming up with insights on what this scope would include but we would like to uh, any thoughts or ideas on attributes that uh, this greening pillar would include from from the group here um, this is where we spent a lot of time working on the first two uh, and this one here I think we at this stage are more um, still thinking about it and like I said looking for ideas from the committee so as a reminder, the Green Fund currently has three pillars, one for funding projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, two, improving energy efficiency, and three, improving water quality and rehabilitation. And one of the, the uh, priorities identified by the committee was adding a re-greening project pillar to this fund. So this will require a change in the terms of reference, which will be brought here to the committee and then to council for final approval. Um, so what we were hoping is um, if there's any thoughts, project ideas, or components that this pillar could include, such as 
Um, you know, when we're looking at healthy, resilient ecosystems or habitat restoration, anything that comes to mind, and we're going to talk about this more in our working group meeting later this month, but we wanted to open it up to the committee for some burning ideas or thoughts that they think should be included into this as we start that scoping process. Yeah, we might have to have like some uh, time to think about it and respond, like either sure. email or through, I don't know, we could do a Jamboard session or something like that, just to kind of get some ideas down. Uh, that's my, can... my thought. It, we don't have a lot of people um, at this point left to help help with throwing ideas forward for this. That's a good idea. What I'll do, Jamie, in the essence of time, is I will prepare a, a, a small one question survey and I will share it with the group and collect ideas that way. Yeah, I think, you know, something like that would work for me. I don't know if it works for everybody else. Hopefully that's all right with, with you, Mark, and you, Andre, and, and you know, I, I, can I can give some thought to the question and respond. Yeah, I think if you put something out there, just give me a bit of time to research it and look it up so I can okay. you know. And we will be bringing the, um, you know, rescoped uh, component to the committee for discussion. Um, so that won't be your only chance to do so. So appreciate your kind of taking off guard there and uh, we'll work with you uh, to ensure everyone can share some insight and feedback on that. I'm really thrilled that uh, you all uh, that are, uh, we're taking this forward. Um, Pedro, Eric, Emily, um, Sam, that you did it so quickly, like you moved on it. That's fantastic. And uh, we're going to see some, some, uh, some results out of this in the near future, it sounds like, which is great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's it. Okay. That. Are we moving on now to your staff update, Emily? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think you can see it. Okay, great. Okay, so I'm just going to breeze through um, some staff updates on my end. Um, lots on the go in the past month or so. Um, on March 21st, we launched the uh, single use plastic community consultations campaign. Um, as when I was preparing this last week, as of April 7th, we've had 705 responses to the community survey which I have to say uh, in my time doing community consultations uh, for municipalities, I've never seen something um, receive that volume of responses. So I think that's a good sign. I will do a deeper dive into the analytics once the survey closes, which is April 21st. Um, we have another survey, which is the business survey. I know that one's gone up to 77 responses, which is really good to see as well. So, um, you know, well over, we've, we've hit that uh, over 500 mark, which is what I was aiming for. So I'm happy. Um, we had an open house, a virtual open house on the 7th. We had 39 people register and about 21 to 25 attendees hopping in and out, which I think was pretty great. Lots of good discussions there. Um, we will be taking a few weeks to summarize all the findings and sharing that with the team at the city, which includes public works, legal and engineering, and then bringing that to council. Uh, the deadline that was um, addressed for staff to do this research was July 1st, so um, countdown is on for the, that analysis. A um, couple of updates on the retrofit, retrofit front. We've got a lot of retrofits on the go at the city, um, mainly LED lighting. Um, the small business lighting projects are progressing um, with the IESO's uh, assessment team. One installation is complete. We've got five work orders received. So that means that they're ready for installation. They're just being reviewed by the ISO. But we've got 23 assets that have been assessed, um, which is nice to see. Uh, so lots of upgrades that were required, but you know, glad to see it's getting done. Um, the John Rhodes and the Northern Community Center LED retrofits are nearing completion. And the RFP was put out for the John Rhodes heat recovery project which the committee approved funding for last year. So hopefully we'll have an update for you all on that uh, at the next meeting. 
Um, we had our first working group meeting, which I think went very well. Um, and I wanted to just highlight briefly that I did attend uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario Local Area Services, so that's their energy group arm, energy symposium at the end of March. And there was a lot of really great information shared there. And one of them was um, the city of Brantford and their climate lens. There's other municipalities. Pedro talked about this briefly earlier about having, you know, an environmental policy or an environmental lens to things. Uh, so this is something that we're looking into at the city and hopefully we'll have some more information on that soon. Um, just to continue on, as I know we're getting tight on time here. Uh, last month, we held our World Water Day community presentation. Uh, this was a binational event. Um, the link to the recording is here. Uh, I will caveat that I was talking to Sam earlier, the hyperlinks are working in this package. So we're gonna update that and that will be on the, um, the city's corporate calendar at a later date if anyone wants to take a look at. Well attended, that was a really nice uh, presentation. Um, April 8th, the city participated in the city studio hubbub, which is when all those projects that the city partnered on with Algoma U um, are shared and uh, presented. So we, this featured some of the work that the city's doing on a voluntary local review of our official plan backgrounder through the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the draft official plan was also brought to council earlier this week, and we will be sending this to the Climate Risk Institute who prepared the city's climate risk assessment back in 2020 to review from a climate lens. Um, I wanted to do a quick plug, if you haven't heard already, the city has partnered with the Kensington Conservancy and the Conservation Authority to host an Earth Day Bio Blitz. Um, the, I will share the link later on, it was supposed to work here, but essentially um, residents are encouraged to get out over the Earth Day weekend, which is next weekend, and take pictures of plants and animals and upload them to the iNaturalist app. I'm not sure if there's any users of that here, but it's a pretty great tool for identifying species as well as invasive species. Um, and it's a, it's a nice initiative to get people outside as we, we move forward in this hopefully post COVID world and also be safe. So check it out. Um, and we've also uh, rescheduled and are moving forward with our solar energy opportunities webinar. Um, we announced that this week, we already have 16 people signed up for that. That's taking place May 11th. Um, and you know, thank you, the PUC, Mark, you will be there talking with us as well. So we're very happy about that. Um, and I just have a couple of shared resources here uh, for anyone who wants to check them out. There was another IPCC report uh, that was shared recently. Um, the press release is there specifically as it pertains to mitigation actions. Um, I encourage folks to give that one a check if they can. Um, and in conclusion, our next spotlight next month will be Andre Riapel. And uh, with that, I am done my update. One minute to spare. I was about to say, Miss Emily 529. Um, super. All right. Anything further before we adjourn for today? Any questions for Emily from her report? No? Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. We will see you again, uh, if not before, on May 12th. Ciao. Thanks, Donna. Bye, all.